have the opportunity to, to do this together. Welcome to church, <laughs> and welcome to spring. You're welcome. We, uh, we decided on the same weekend you would lose an hour and 30 degrees, just to help test the strength of your faith. So I'm glad you're at church today, and you came to the 9 o'clock in Newark, to the 10 o'clock in Hokessin. We're glad you're here. So proud of you. Way to go. Give yourselves a hand. We're in week two of a series called Gratitude Adjustment, all about the surprising benefits of gratitude in our lives. And uh, before we jump into the second message of the series, as I always do, let me look in the camera, say a big hello to everyone at our online location and everyone at our Hokessin location. Newark, will you help me show some love to all of our locations? And uh, before we jump in as well, I want to take a moment and just share with you some of what's coming up over the next few weeks. So there are two more weeks of this series that we're in called Gratitude Adjustment after today. And then we'll start a brand new series called Moments That Matter. It starts the first weekend of April. I'm very excited about this. We have uh, prayed about and planned some spiritual moments for you to experience during the month of April. It's going to be a powerful season, so I encourage you to be a part of that. It's going to lead that series into Easter weekend, uh, where we are predicting with great faith it's going to be warmer. Uh, and if not, we're going to have a great Easter anyway. We're going to celebrate together. We have 15 gatherings planned across our locations this year. So lots of opportunities, not only for you to be a part of it, not only for you to, uh, to serve and find a way to make a difference during Easter, but also start praying about who you want to invite to Easter weekend and uh, who you're going to invest in and give an invitation to. That's going to lead us into Baptism Weekend, which is another powerful moment during the month of April. Many of you have put your faith in Jesus over the past few months. You've taken steps to follow Jesus, and this is an opportunity for you to go public with your faith through baptism. So if you've never taken that step uh, yet, you can find out more in the weeks to come. We'll tell you all about that. You can sign up uh, and be prepared to be baptized that uh, last weekend of April, and then in the middle of all of that is our Easter offering. So if you're new to our community of faith, every Christmas and Easter, uh, we give above and beyond our regular giving to make a difference outside our walls. So this is not an offering to pay our bills. Our bills are already paid through the generosity of our church family and many of you. Uh, but this is an opportunity to, to do something outside of our walls. And I'm very excited uh, that we're going to have an opportunity to participate in a moment that matters, a moment of generosity, April 9th and 10th. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm really pumped about is that this year, a big part of our Easter offering is going to go to help other churches and pastors outside of the journey. And I'll tell you more about that in the weeks to come, but we really feel like God's given us a vision to be a blessing to the church outside our walls, throughout our region and around our country. And uh, I'm very excited about that. So be praying about how God would have you be a part of that. And as we jump into week two of gratitude adjustment, I want to start as I often do, did this last week too, if you were here uh, for week one of the series, but I want to start with a little poll, all right? So everyone can participate at all of our locations. You don't have to be a church person. This applies to all of us. So think very hard about these questions. Be prepared to thoughtfully respond, all right? So here we go. First question, which day of the week do you like better? Mondays, or Fridays. We're all my Monday people. Monday people, show of hands, show of hands, Monday people. All right? All my Friday people, come on. Woo! Yeah, we're like, party! Friday people. Okay, next question. 
Which do you enjoy more, going to school or work or going on vacation? Okay, think hard about this one. We're all my school work people, show of hands, show of hands, love going to school, love going to work, just like work me to the bone, just got to go, got to go. Okay, all my vacation people, come on, raise a flip-flop in the air and wave it like you just don't care. Come on, vacation people. All right. Last question, which do you prefer? It's really, this one really got to think about. Which do you prefer? Putting in effort in your relationships, your health, your finances, whatever it may be, putting in lots of effort or enjoying the results of previous efforts, which you enjoy more, putting in effort or enjoying the results. We're all my effort people. You just love to put in effort. No sign it's ever going to pay off, but you just love it, just putting in the effort. All right, where are all my results people? Results people, come on, come on, represent all of our locations, results people, good. So whatever you believe about God, here's the question, week two of the series. What if, what if your life could change in such a way that you began to be just as grateful for Mondays as you were for Fridays? You may not believe that's even possible, but what could your life look like if that were the case? What could your life look like if you were just as grateful for schoolwork or for your job as you were for vacation? What if you could be just as thankful for the efforts you put in as you were for the results you enjoyed? So in the New Testament of the Bible, we find a bunch of letters written to followers of Jesus, and this is one of the themes that carries throughout many of these letters, this encouragement to find a reason to be grateful in every moment of our lives. One of the first of these letters that was written is a letter called Galatians. It was written to people who were struggling to stay focused on their faith in Jesus. These were followers of Jesus, struggling to stay focused in the midst of what felt like a lot of spiritual Mondays. And they were experiencing distraction and temptation. They were being tempted to to go a different direction, to start believing all kinds of things that were different than the message of Jesus that they had heard, putting their faith and their trust in different areas, and, and different teachers were claiming to bring new revelations and new truths, and they were just struggling to stay focused. And in the last chapter of the book of Galatians, we read these words, don't be misled, you cannot mock the justice of God. Don't be misled, you cannot mock the justice of God. Sounds kind of ominous, doesn't it? Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. That's just the way I hear it. I don't know why when I read those words, it just sounds very kind of heavy. Just It's a lot to think about. And remember, this is written to followers of Jesus. Now, here's what you have to understand. These were people who knew they did not have to face the justice of God. Because Jesus had already faced God's justice on their behalf and on our behalf. For all of us who believe in Jesus, we actually do not have to face the justice of God toward our sins. This is the good news, the message of Jesus, that all of our sins, everything that we've ever thought, said, or done that was less than God's best for us, we all have them. By the way, you have sins, I have sins, every human being who's ever lived has had sins. All of those sins had stacked up. They had come in between us and God. God's justice demanded that a price be paid for our sins. You say, why would that be the case? Because God is a holy and perfect God. If our sin did not make him upset and angry, he would not be a God worth worshiping. And so all of that is stacked up between us and God. But the good news is Jesus came and paid the price in his human flesh. He was God, but he was also fully human. And in his humanity, he paid the price. He faced God's justice on our behalf. We are forgiven of our sins. We are made right with God through what Jesus did. So these people this was written to knew that they didn't have to face God's justice for their sins. So why in the world would God be reminding them through his word not to be misled? Why would he be reminding them that they could not mock the justice of God? Well, the reason is very simple. There is a principle that applies after we find Jesus. Now, it applies before we put our faith in Jesus, but some people misunderstand. Some people think, well, when I find Jesus, my sins are paid for. I don't have to face the justice of God. Therefore, from this moment on, I can just live however I want to live, and it's okay. Heaven's on lock. I've got Jesus in my life. Doesn't matter what I do. And there is a sense in which that is true. 
We are saved through what Jesus did for us in our faith in him plus nothing. Not good works, not good deeds, not being religious, not, not serving on probation. We are saved by what Jesus did. But there is a principle that applies to the rest of our lives. Many people don't realize it. That's why God says, don't be misled. Here it is. You will always harvest what you plant. You will always harvest what you plant. When I was a little kid, my dad had a garden. It was a, a small garden uh, in our backyard. And uh, he, he planted potatoes there, carrots, uh, green beans. And do you know what grew in that garden when my dad planted potatoes? Wait for it. Potatoes. Do you know what grew when my dad planted carrots? Carrots. Do you know what grew when my dad planted green beans? All right, this is a sharp crowd. It's difficult to get anything past you. Green beans. God's justice cannot be mocked. We will always harvest what we plant. Now, I'm going to submit to you today that this is actually a reason to be grateful. You say, I don't understand. How is that a reason to be grateful? Because it means, and you've got to catch this, we get to decide a lot of what our lives here on earth end up looking like. God has decided what our lives in eternity will look like through the sacrifice of his son, and he has made it possible now for us to choose. Before we knew Jesus, how many of us know this is true? We wanted to do good, but we couldn't do good. But now that we've met Jesus, we have been transformed and we are being transformed by him. And this is a reason to be grateful because now we get to decide what our lives look like. Gratitude comes from being confident in God's promise. If I plant the right things, eventually I will harvest the right things. You say, well, how long will it take? I don't know. I'm not in control of the garden. God is. But I do know the principle applies, and it is a promise of God. We will always harvest what we plant. It's not even a mystical promise of God. It actually is the way the universe works. Potatoes, potatoes. <laughs> carrots, carrots. Green beans, green beans. Some of us are trying to we're trying to cheat the principle. We're like, well, I'm going to plant potatoes, but I intend to get some carrots. God says, no, it doesn't work that way. But there's a reason for great joy when we understand if I will plant the right things, even though planting can be difficult, eventually I'll harvest the right things. You say, well, I'm trying to teach my kids about God, and that doesn't seem to be getting through. Yes, but we will always harvest what we plant. You say, well, I'm trying to figure out my finances and I'm making changes to honor God and I'm trying to spend more wisely and put God first. <laughs> it does not feel like there's a harvest anywhere on the horizon, but we will always harvest what we plant. I'm trying to forgive my mom and it's taking everything I have. I feel like I have to forgive her again every day. In fact, during this message, she texted me and I had to forgive her again. <laughs> yes, but we will always harvest what we plant. God designed the universe so that each living thing contains within itself in seed form the potential for a harvest of more of the same. No farmer goes out and looks at his or her field and says, I wonder what will grow there. They know it's exactly what I planted. And the same is true, listen, for everything we think about and meditate on, everything we say, everything we do, everything we plant in our lives is a seed that contains within itself the promise of a harvest of more. Every prayer prayed is an answer in seed form. Oh, I believe it. I don't know if anybody else believes it, but it will change the way we pray when we believe it. This is not just a prayer that I'm praying. It is an answer in seed form. This is so powerful because some of us disconnect praying from answers. We go, well, I'm going to pray. I'll probably never see an answer, but I'm just going to pray. I'm going to pray. My prayers don't really mean a lot. I'm going to pray the same thing today that I prayed yesterday. I'll probably pray the same thing tomorrow. I get caught in this trap, and we forget that this isn't just a prayer that's going to live and die by itself. It's an answer in seed form. And you say, well, how many prayers do I have to pray before I see the harvest? I don't know. I'm not in charge of that. I'm God. And don't trust anybody who says they do know. But I do know that you will always, you will always 
Harvest what you plant. Every act of unseen kindness is a future thriving relationship in seed form. Every sacrifice that doesn't make sense at the time is a reward from God in seed form. We will always harvest what we plant. It's a reason to be grateful. And not only that, but the harvest is always larger than the seeds. I mean, think about it. This is a packet of seeds. This is corn. This is not impressive. Nobody looks at seeds and goes, oh, look at those tiny, shriveled up, insignificant looking seeds. Oh. Nobody does that. Why? Because seeds are small and unglamorous and easily overlooked. But if I were to cover this stage with soil, plant these seeds in that soil, make sure they got plenty of water, put a skylight in the roof so they got some sunlight, watched over them, these This little packet of seeds could eventually cover this entire stage. Because not only do we harvest what we plant, but we harvest a multiplication of what we plant. So be encouraged if it feels like what you're planting in your life right now seems small and insignificant. You're only looking at the seed form. You haven't seen the harvest yet. You're only looking at... This doesn't feel good right now. This doesn't seem like much right now. This doesn't seem like it will ever amount to anything right now, but you're not seeing the harvest. This is the story of our church. Our church was a, our church is a 15 year overnight success. We, we have planted a lot of seeds. I think about what's happening at our Hokesson location. H-Town, love you so much. Proud of you. We planted a lot of seeds, and now every week, lives are being changed. There's a harvest of changed lives. Slowly but surely, the good news of Jesus taking root in that community, along with other life-giving churches, and the goodness of God is spreading. Why? Because we didn't stop planting seeds, and we won't stop planting seeds. Now, that's encouraging when it comes to good seeds we plant, honesty and generosity and gratitude, but it also explains... Why just a few words spoken in anger can tear a friendship apart. It explains why a little habit kept secret can unravel a a whole career. Why a few small indiscretions can lead to great consequences. Have you ever had moments in your life where like, I I just had no idea this would ever turn into that? Come on, have you? Like, I didn't know that one argument was going to spiral and now we're not speaking to each other. I didn't know that one little habit. I thought I had it under control. I had no idea that actually an addiction was forming. I, did, I, I just didn't know. I, I, I thought it was something harmless and small and simple. I didn't know that just that one little compromise was going to lead me to a place where I could no longer be secure in my own character. I didn't have integrity. I just had, I didn't know. It's just a few seeds. Because the harvest is a multiplication of whatever we plant, good or bad. It's of the same form, but it's always larger. And that makes the next part really important. Listen to these words. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Remember, this is written to people who believe in Jesus. And if you're not there yet, you're probably going decay and death, sinful nature. I mean, what is that all about? But all of us who know Jesus understand this. Even if the words are a little bit unfamiliar to us, if we're newer to our faith, we get what this means. Because before we met Jesus, we lived only to satisfy ourselves, right? Some of us were really noble about it. We acted like we were very humble and generous, but we know deep inside We lived to satisfy ourselves. We couldn't help it because we were our own God. So we bowed down and worshiped ourselves every day. We never would have described it that way. We were in it for us, man. And we served only our own desires. But now that we found Jesus, we live to please him. And we live to please the spirit of God. Without God in our lives, what was happening? Our relationships were decaying. Our souls were dying. But Jesus changed that by changing us, and it's powerful. But here's the sobering thought. Remember who this is written to, followers of Jesus, which means that it's possible to fall back into our old patterns, to have put our faith in Jesus, but then over time to be misled and to forget that we will always harvest what we plant. You say, why would that happen to us? Because we like Fridays better than Mondays. 
It's because we like vacations better than school days or work days. It's because we like payoffs more than we like planting. So we're tempted to plant weeds rather than good seeds. Because weeds sprout fast. They also put down roots that can end up taking over a garden. But we don't see that. We see the instant results. We're very instant gratification oriented. Come on, how many of us? I am. How many of us would just admit I'm instant gratification? I want to press the buttons on the microwave, and 45 seconds later, I expect my life to be better. Like, I just want, that's how it should work. And so we end up planting weeds. Think of all the examples. If you do this now, your troubles will go away. The reality is far more troubles will show up later. We're going to harvest. The only question is, what are we planting? God's word says that if we will begin to live to please the Spirit, if we'll, that's not talking about perfection, that's talking about direction. If we'll allow the Holy Spirit, God's presence and power to nudge us and guide us and prompt us and direct us, and if needed, correct us, we will harvest everlasting life. If we'll plant good seeds, we will always harvest what we plant. You say, does that mean I'll have a life that always goes the way I want? No, you'll have a life that eventually grows into what you deeply desire. Because we always harvest what we plant. In other words, here's the principle, week two of the series, a life I can be grateful for starts with being grateful for my life, exactly as it is right now, on a Monday, spiritually speaking, on a work day, on a school day, on an effort day. It starts with being grateful for my life right now, not just the harvest part of my life. It's easy to be grateful for the harvest, right? That's easy. I don't have to teach a message on when God fixes everything in your life and everything goes your way, be sure to be happy. Like, I don't have to teach that. We get that, most of us. But this is about being grateful for the planting part of our lives. See, until we can find purpose in the planting, we'll never see the kinds of harvest we desire. Because it's in the planting, not just weeds, but good seeds. It's in the planting that we set ourselves up for the harvest. We have a lot more control over what our lives end up looking like on this planet than we realize. By faith in Jesus, we have the, the power to plant good seeds and to harvest what we plant. But when we don't see that, we start planting weeds instead of good seeds. We start planting decisions that lead to regrets rather than to healthy relationships. We start chasing pursuits that end in emptiness rather than fulfillment. So what should we do about this? Well, it's actually really straightforward. Here it is. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. Why? Because at just the right time, whose time? Not our time, God's time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. That's what God wants for us. He wants to give us a harvest of blessing. That's God's posture toward us. He wants us to continue planting. He's saying, don't get tired of Mondays. Please don't give up when the efforts are not yet resulting in what you hope to achieve. Please don't stop doing what is good. Don't get tired of doing right things, even in the absence of right results. Don't get tired of pleasing the Spirit, even when it seems like the world around you is screaming at you to please your own human flesh again. Keep pursuing me, God says, because I desire to give you a harvest of blessing. It will be like what you plant, but it will be more than you plant. Can I tell you, I've had some times in my life when I got tired of doing what is good. Anybody else? Anybody ever gotten tired just of doing what is good? I went through a season five years ago when I wanted to quit being a pastor. I asked God every day for several months, can I quit? Can I do something else? I'm tired. This is something good that I'm called to do, but I started getting tired. And I felt like there was too much planting and not enough harvesting. Come on, anybody felt that way? Too much planting, not enough harvesting. You say, what caused that season of discouragement and burnout? Was it dealing with difficult people? Was it long hours? Was it unmet expectations? Disappointments? unfulfilled dreams. No, it wasn't any of that. Now, I had all those things, but it wasn't any of that. What caused it was me. 
was me. Because I stopped being grateful for my Mondays. See, once we stop being grateful for the hardest moments of life with Jesus, it isn't long until we stop being grateful for the easiest ones. And the truth is, once we lose a sense of purpose around planting, it isn't long until we start to lose the hope of a harvest. And some of us need to hear this. Some of us are going, work is burning me out. No, it's not. Your work doesn't have that kind of power. Only you do. You will always harvest what you plant. Well, my family, I would really, you know, I could go somewhere if it wasn't for my... No, your family doesn't have that power. You are always harvesting what you plant. I will harvest what I plant. And what led me into that season of burnout and discouragement at the end of the day wasn't any circumstance around me. It was an attitude within me that I lost sense of the privilege of planting. I wanted the happiness of harvest, but I was tired of the privilege of planting. You want to know what I learned during that season? Here it is. Immature people only like results. Mature people learn to love the process. I was an immature person. I needed a gratitude adjustment. God, I am grateful for another hard day of planting seeds that show no immediate results, but I planted them by faith, so I know they will pay off. I'm going to keep planting. God, I trust you for the harvest. And in the meantime, while I am waiting for things to change, and while I'm waiting for something to shift, while I'm waiting for my health to shift, while I'm waiting for my circumstances to change, while I'm waiting for somebody in my life to get their act together, I am going to keep giving you thanks for the privilege of still having seeds in my hand that I get to choose whether or not I plant. It's the privilege of planting because a life we can be grateful for starts with being grateful for our life just as it is right now. We will always harvest what we plant. The only thing that can keep us from the harvest is getting tired and giving up. So my spouse is keeping me from the harvest. No. My job's keeping, no. My financial, no. My, no. No, 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 no. The only thing that can keep us from the harvest is us getting tired of planting and giving up. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody today that the only thing that can keep you from what God has in store for you is if you stop planting prematurely. Because there is no scenario in which you and I live our lives faithfully honoring God and he does not reward that. There is no scenario in which we live our lives faithfully honoring God and he does not reward that. So don't give up. Don't get tired. Some of you are students or young adults and you are surrounded by temptation to settle for something that the world says is right, even though you know God has a different perspective. Can I preach to you? Don't get tired of doing what is good. You are planting seeds that are setting the stage for the life you were made for, and it doesn't matter what the world around you says. It matters what God says about your life. Some of you are allowing your wife or your girlfriend to carry all the spiritual weight in the relationship. You even say things like, well, you know, she's the church one, she's the spiritual one, and maybe you are enjoying some fringe benefits of her faithfulness for now, but you'll find yourself staring at an empty garden if you don't step up and follow Jesus for yourself because you will always harvest what you plant. So step up and follow Jesus. You say it's hard. I know anything worth doing is. Don't get tired of doing what is good. Come on, somebody. You will always (laughs) harvest what you plant. Some of you are raising kids and you've made mistakes and you've dropped the ball and you're racked with guilt and you sh- and shame and you think, what's the use now? How do I ever make up for what I did wrong? Start planting good seeds now. Go back and apologize if you have to. Rebuild the relationship and reestablish the foundation. In our house, we love Jesus. We pray. We go to church. We live by God's values. You say, but my kid might resent me if I try to force my spirituality on them. Yes, they might. For now, 
but they will not resent you 30 years from now when they run into a crisis and remember that you taught them the only one who could help them in their moment of greatest need. So don't get tired. Don't give up. You will always harvest what you plant and do it in a life-giving way, but you will always harvest what you plant. Get some backbone to your, to your faith. Get some strength to your commitment to Jesus. Keep planting. Don't get tired of doing what is good. Keep gathering, connecting in a group, serving. Keep praying. Keep reading the Bible. Keep inviting. Keep taking steps in your faith. Don't get tired and don't give up. Don't just be grateful for the harvest. Be thankful for the privilege of planting. We will always harvest what we plant. All right, one more piece to this. It's really practical. Here we go. Therefore, and by the way, whenever there's a therefore in the Bible, you should ask what it's there for. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, which is God's way of saying, I know some of us only like to plant when we feel like planting. (laughs) He says, whenever we have the opportunity, in other words, whenever we're breathing, whenever we're awake, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. And what does that mean? Here's what it means. The most important seeds that we will ever plant are not for us. I know, that's hard. (laughs) Because you were tracking with me. You're like, I'm going to keep planting because I'm going to have a harvest. Yeah, the reason we get tired and the reason we give up is because we are often faced with the reality that God has called us to live beyond ourselves, not for ourselves. Remember, we used to live only to satisfy our own sinful nature. Now we're followers of Jesus, so we live like he lived in this world. So the most important seeds that God calls us to plant are actually to make others' lives better. You say, well, whose lives? Everyone's. (laughs) The people you work with and people you're related to and the people you wish you weren't related to, neighbors, and the people on 95, let's make their lives better. Come on. (laughs) But notice that last part, especially to those in the family of faith. Listen very closely. What that means is that God has called every one of us who believes in Jesus. Now, if you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus yet, you can take a pass on this for now. This comes after faith in Jesus. God has called all of us who believe in Jesus, whether we believed in him five minutes ago, five weeks ago, five years ago, 25 years ago, all of us to be a part of a family of faith. You say, well, I got, the, no, I got this thing going on with God. Actually, If you think you just have a thing going on with God, you don't have much of a thing going on with God. John in the New Testament said, how can we even love God whom we haven't seen if we don't learn how to love our brothers and sisters that we see every day? Only way I have something good going on with God is if I have something good going on with God's people. I'm not close to people who don't like my children. Think about that for a minute. God is not close to people who don't like his other kids. So God's called every one of us to be a part of a family of faith. So if you, if you believe in Jesus, but you've been treating church like a product to be consumed, this could help explain why the harvest keep being delayed in your life. Because God's called all of us to be a part of a family of faith and then to plant seeds in that family of faith. And we plant seeds everywhere. And we talk about that all the time here outside our walls. We don't live a weekend relationship with God. We live a 24-7 relationship with God. But especially to those in the family of faith, we're supposed to plant seeds. We're supposed to serve each other. When? Whenever we have the opportunity. And the way we, we apply this here is what we call our J team. This is a family of people who give their time and talent to serve, from impressions to journey kids and journey students and production and administration and prayer, leading groups, hosting online. I mean, all of the different expressions of serving. And if you haven't yet, you should join the J team. And I'll tell you why. One reason, because a life we can be grateful for starts with being grateful for our life 
And we can't be grateful for our life, watch this, until we start living it for the purpose we were given it, which is to give it away. You were given life to give it away. I was given life to give it away, to plant it. See, the seeds of your life aren't doing anything in your pockets. They're not doing anything in your barn. Some of us are going, I can't wait for the harvest. I've been hoarding the seeds. And I can't wait to see what God does. I could t- Let me spare you a lot of... Uh, a lot of time and, and disappointment. God's going to do nothing. Because he won't do anything until you plan them. So I'm expecting a miracle. I'm expecting God to come into the barn. And one day I'm going to walk into the barn and there's a harvest. No, there's no harvest there. We will always harvest what we plant. So God's called you to be a part of a family of faith and not to take your time and your talent and your gifts and your experiences and your stories and just use them for yourself, but to plant them in good soil. And you can learn to love Mondays as much as Fridays when you know you have a purpose in your life. And you can learn to love hard work as much as harvest when you know you have a purpose in your life. So if you haven't, if you're, if you're not serving your family of faith, I want to encourage you to do that. You can make that decision today. Join the J team. Serve. If you are serving your family of faith, don't get tired doing what is good. Because at just the right time, you'll harvest whatever you planted. Now, whatever you didn't plant, you won't harvest. But whatever you did plant, you will harvest. And a life you can be grateful for starts with being grateful for that kind of life. Your life, exactly as it is right now, and your willingness to plant it. It's a gratitude adjustment. And if you would say, week two of the series, man, I, I need God's strength to do that. I don't want to get tired of doing what is good. I, I want that gratitude adjustment this week. I want to keep planting by faith. Or maybe for some of you, I want to really start planting some better seeds in my family, in my family of faith, in my prayers, in my relationship with God, would you just shoot your hand up all over the room? Hocus and shoot it up online. Shoot it up high right where you are. Let me pray for us. Father, we love and honor you today. God, we give you all the praise and all the thanks. I think what a lot of us, God, are realizing in this moment right now is that we have seeds. And maybe we've been procrastinating. Maybe we've been and we've been discouraged like I was in that season a few years ago. We just were tired and we've, our attitude's gotten out of whack. God, you don't come to condemn us, but you come strongly to encourage us not to be misled. I thank God you're urging us not to stop planting good seeds because the harvest depends on them. So I pray over us right now. I pray over every single one of us who believe in Christ, who believe in you, Jesus, that we would live like you in this world, that we would take the seeds out of our pockets, out of our barns, out of our places where we've stored them safely away. We would start scattering them, letting go of them, planting them, serving you, serving each other, serving our family of faith. God, let the world see that we are are different. We're not just religious people. We're transformed people. Let it change our world, we pray, for your glory. And God, we're trusting you for the harvest. And we started out today with a really intense verse from the Bible, don't be misled, you cannot mock the justice of God. And for some of you, uh, maybe you've lived life without God up until now. So the truth is, here's what God says, you may not believe it yet, this is what God says. He says, if you plant a life without God, you will harvest a life without God. That's the bad news. The good news is, through Jesus, you can have a fresh start. That He wants to give you a new life. Believing in Jesus doesn't make you a church person or religious person. It makes you a changed person. And you can experience that change right here, right now. I'm going to lead us in prayer again. 
And if that's you, in all of our locations, you want to begin a real relationship with God, I want to encourage you just to whisper out a prayer of faith something like this right where you are. Jesus, today I believe in you. I believe you died to forgive my sins. I believe that through you I have new life. Save me now. I want to follow you. And if that's you, well, everyone around you stays focused on God, if you would say, I want to be included in that prayer, will you lift your hand? Hold it up high. One all over the room. Hold it up high. I'm putting my faith in Jesus. So guess it. Hold it up. Online, type the word faith in the comments, whatever platform you're on. Just let us know. And then everybody, will you help me? Let's give Jesus all the praise. Come on, let's